many people feel that oh hypothyroidism has become so common you know it's it's, it's all over the place but actually we don't know if that's true at all dr anju kahi vice president and uh, head preventive health care at vlcc your host for the session today with me are uh, our co panelists padma bhushan dr amrish mittal india's leading endocrinologist eminent cardiologist dr dheeraj bhatia and nutrition expert dr deepthi each of whom you will meet shortly okay so vlcc everybody knows vlcc as a leader in beauty and wellness domain and is present in almost 310 locations in 143 cities across 12 countries in south asia southeast asia gcc region and east africa our wellness program uh, is recommended by ima the indian medical association and uh, this webinar actually uh, it's a part of our monthly webinar series and uh, our educational contribution to holistic wellness through uh, quality information and healthy lifestyle choices so let's begin for today i'm sure uh, we you know all of us have heard someone complain oh you know i have thyroid and i feel really really run down all the time so well thyroid is not a disease but it's just a gland and all of us have one it's located in our neck here in front of the windpipe and uh, it looks like a butterfly so it's called the butterfly gland and is very very critical to our uh, health you know so let me speak a little more about this butterfly gland this thyroid gland it produces a hormone called t4 or the thyroxin which gets converted into t3 the active hormone in our blood and cells and this plays a major role in metabolism growth and development of our body so since it's affecting our metabolism uh, what is metabolism it is the capacity of our body to convert resources like food into energy so what happens it directly or indirectly affects all the functions of the body uh this may include the brain the eyes the speech the voice the skin the hair heart even muscles bones digestive system and menstrual cycles in women even regulation of body temperature and uh, also cholesterol levels and many many more will be coming to all that so in hyperthyroidism the thyroid releases more hormones than normal while in hypothyroidism the gland does not produce enough hormones or it underperforms so today we will draw attention to the far more common of the two and that is hypothyroidism hypothyroid is a hormone deficiency you know uh, decades ago hypothyroidism was uh, actually due to iodine deficiency in our diet but india's successful salt iodization program has removed this common cause almost completely and um, hypothyroidism now is more likely to be due, due to an autoimmune response so what is autoimmunity where autoimmunity is where the body fails to recognize the thyroid gland as part of itself and you know it actually launches an attack which leads to hypothyroidism and uh, this is also called hashimotos disease so uh, the thing is that is hypothyroidism common in india surprisingly yes it's it's common affecting almost 1 in 10 indians it affects more women than men and in about 3.5% people there are clear clinical manifestation of this uh, deficiency and that's why it's called overt hypothyroidism and in further 8% of population there may not be any such clear symptoms but a slight derangement of the hormones 
a form of disease we call subclinical or mild or subtle hypothyroidism. So to help us learn much more about hypothyroidism, how to detect, how to manage it, our esteemed panel of very experienced doctors now will address the questions you have asked us while registering and also any others you may ask us as we go along. So I'm, I'm really delighted to welcome and introduce to you our first panelist for today, Dr. Dhiraj Bhatia. Dr. Bhatia has over 35 years of clinical consultancy practice in New Delhi, and uh, he's been a senior consultant cardiologist with Escorts Heart Institute and Max Super Speciality Delhi. And also he has been the senior medical advisor to VLCC for the last 20 years. Good evening, Dr. Bhatia, and welcome to the webinar. And thank you so much for joining us today. Very good evening, uh, Dr. Anju, and thanks thank for the- Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Bhatia. So thank, thank you, and thanks for the introduction. Yes. And uh, good evening, uh, viewers. It's uh, nice that you all taken time out to be with us uh, for our continuing uh, empowerment, uh, knowledge empowerment sessions, which uh, we have on the 15th. And I find that people, you know, coming in great numbers, which is very, uh, very good because it's nice to learn about various illnesses from esteemed panels, uh, panelists, which Dr. Anju, you know, uh, she gets to puts together. Uh, so, so today, uh, you know, we are going to address the first question, Dr. Anju. Would you like to say yes, what? Yes. What would they? Uh, uh, let me just uh, t tell you the first question we have for you, Doctor. So it is said, uh, you know, that no part of the body is immune to the effects of hypothyroidism, but sometimes the symptoms are mild and subtle. So uh, what are the most common symptoms and when should we suspect hypothyroidism? Right. So, uh, yeah, that's an important question because very often it gets missed and the earlier it is picked up, the better. So the moment, you know, now I'm going to, uh, you know, go through a few of the symptoms and then come up with the more important ones. Uh, it's very important to realize that you may not have all the symptoms. So, you know, when I speak of symptoms, don't get this feeling that you have to have all of these. You may have <clears throat> just a few subtle symptoms, a very few subtle signs, and that is very important to pick up. So, you know, let's, let's start with, let's say a lady comes into my clinic, you know? So now why I say ladies, because it's 10 times more common in females, especially during the age group of 40 to 60, though it can come at any age group. So, like I said, when she comes in, the first thing I notice is a very tired expression. She comes and she sits in front of my chair. There's yawning. There is fatigue. There's lethargy. It's written all over her face. Second thing you can pick up is there is puffiness of the face. Not all the time. Like I said, not all the symptoms are there, but many are there. Third, uh, you go to the hair and you see the hair is brittle. It is coarse. And then in further cases where it's been there for some time, you'll find that they have thinning of hair and even loss of hair. Next, as you come down, I'm taking them, you know, it's, so, it's easy to remember. So I said, let's start from the top and go down. So that's why I said, you know, first the tired look, then of course the puffiness of the face, then the hair. Then you come to the eyebrows. You'll find the lateral third, this part of the eyebrows, they start thinning. And that sign is called madarosis. It's called madarosis. And it's really sad because it means that it's not been picked up earlier. And we, because we are, you know, VLCC is very good in the hair transplant program. So very often you'll find ladies coming to us and saying, doctor, we have thinning of hair here. Can this be transplanted also? You know, can we do a transplant there as well? So <clears throat> that's another, another very important feature. And then this is, there's a great association of hypothyroid with iron deficiency anemia and B12 deficiency anemia. And that adds to the problem of tiredness. So that's why we tell everybody get a B12 checked and get your iron checked as well. In fact, more than iron these days, we look at the ferritin because ferritin tells us the iron stores while iron just tells you what's in the blood and that can change according to your diet. So it's better to go with ferritin and very often you'll find that this is associated and that's why the fatigue is already there because of hypothyroid. In addition is because of low B12 and they also have uh, this other problem. So then as you go down, you know, we look at the eyes because that's where you look for anemia. We ask them to look up and 
we have a look at the pallor there. Then we look at the tongue and the tongue again, it should be red like that, but you find that very often that it is uh, pale, pale looking. And then of course, the third place you look at is the nails. You feel nails are pale. So these, why I'm narrating these, it's very simple. It can be done by yourself. You can have a look and you can compare with somebody else at home. And you know that there's a problem there. Now you come to the next is your tongue. Now the tongue you'll find, uh, a tongue has a contour like this. It's, you know, sleek and it goes around like that. That's the way it goes. They have something called a concave tongue or what we call macro, macro means big, macroglossia. So the tongue comes up like that, you know? So it's like that, the tongue, instead of being tapered like this. So the tapering is lost. So that's called macroglossia. Now, the goiter is an old thing. You, Hashimoto's, what you're talking about, Dr. Anju, is autoimmune, which we are seeing all the time, thyroid problem or thyroiditis. Itis means inflammation. So right. that is now without the swelling. That was in the old days when we used to have iron de deficiency. So again, to reiterate, we look at the puffiness, the tired expression the patient has. We look at the thinning of the hair the, that comes later, of course, before that, the coarse hair, uh, the rough look, and then the thinning, which we call madrosis, and then the macroglossia, uh, the tongue, and the pallor, I told you why it happens. And, you know, we get a good idea from these three sites, which I just narrated. So just, just to, you know, go through this again so that people remember. Uh, then they can have hoarseness of voice. That is because edema of vocal cords, or sometimes they get reduced in, uh, with hypothyroidism. And as things go further, the, the, the complaint which actually we receive maximum besides fatigue is dry skin. So a lot of them have dry skin, and with that, they have dry eyes. And that's why they will keep on going to the ophthalmologist and they'll keep on rubbing their eyes and they'll keep being told time and again, oh, that this is, this is happening because of Delhi pollution or this is happening because of old age. And actually they don't realize that with this, if there's a fatigue or there is you know, some hair loss, uh, then you should actually start looking at uh, a hypothyroid condition. But the moment you start treatment, the dryness goes, otherwise you keep putting those teardrops you know, artificial teardrops and they're reaching nowhere. They keep jumping from one ophthalmologist to another and that I see very, very com commonly. Uh, they also reach gastroenterologists very often because there is a lot of GRD, gastroesophageal reflux because the motility is dependent on the hormone. So the motility, it slows down. So they have a lot of acidity, they have a lot of reflux. And then you also, because of that, the motility is slow. So they land up with constipation because there's more absorption of the you know, water in the large gut and they land up with constipation. So another very important symptom they have is cold intolerance. Uh, interestingly, there'll always be a row between the husband and the wife because the husband is uh, putting the AC on to full blast and the wife is turning it off. <laughs> so that's a, another presentation, you know, which yeah. they come to us. Sometimes they go to a psychologist as well for this because it really goes out of hand, believe me. Uh, there has a lot of cognitive dysfunction, you know. So we divide it into the central nervous system and peripheral. So now as I'm hopping along, I'm getting now more into, uh, you know, the sequelae of complications. Of course, if you're a female, you'll have some very important system uh, being involved, which is, of course, they will come to you and say, we've not had our uh, cycles for a long time. Or more commonly, they'll say we have uh, severe menorrhagia. Menorrhagia means excessive menstrual bleeding. So they'll again come for that. Now, again, for that, very often they keep going back to the gynae, but they don't associate this problem with the others and not, don't realize that they need you know, to meet a good physician or an endocrinologist and have this sorted out. They could also present with infertility. That's another very big presentation. So as you can see the lots, there's less sweating. That's an, another problem. Like in hyper, there's more sweating. Here, there's less sweating. Now, cognitive dysfunction, which means that the mental you know, status, there is a problem. They complain of something being fogged out. It's a short-term memory, not clear. We feel like hazy all the time, like they've not slept well. There's a kind of, you know, a brain kind of fog or a block, what, what they mentioned. And then gradually there's, you know, anxiety, there's irritability, uh, there is, you know, the short-tempered. And interestingly, they found when they've done scans that where the memory uh, area is the hippocampus, that is shrunken. Now, that's why it's important. Don't take uh, hypothyroid as, a, as like you're saying, like a disease, which is uh, a death sentence or, you know, a very morbid condition, not at all. But what we're trying to do is give information, give these symptoms, 
so that it is picked up early. So <clears throat> this is a central kind of thing. Then they can sometimes be, you know, they get onto antidepressants and they keep on increasing the antidepressants without realizing that they have hypothyroid and, you know, which can actually be managed with that. Now, uh, peripherally, peripheral nervous system is when the nerves go from the spinal cord into the peripheral nervous system. So when that starts getting affected, they start having tingling and numbness uh, or, you know, slight kind of pain. Usually it is more sensory. They don't really land up with a weakness. If they land up with a weakness, then we are in trouble because the cause there is like a muscle problem, which we call myopathy. So the moment somebody starts saying with some of these other symptoms that we have tingling or we have some kind of problem, it's good that a neuro uh, neurologist sees them. And we call the study called uh, EPS, you know, electrophysiology studies, nerve conduction velocities, they are checked. So it's very important to do that because otherwise it'll be mixed, it'll be missed. And you can have large fiber, you know, mostly you can have sensory fibers, but it's usually an exonal kind of problem. So that the neurologists are very good. They pick it up very, you know, fine. And the earlier you pick it up, the earlier you treat is better. So this is one very important complication, you know, coming to uh, another complication is the cardiac part. The cardiac part, they have a slow heart rate. They have a slow heart rate, but mind you, sinus. Now, sinus means that the, it is regular. It's not irregular, this thing. And why it happens is because the sympathetic system is wired through the thyroxin, the hormone. So, uh, so it plays up with the adrenaline, and then you find that the person starts having a slow heart rate. And then as things get worse, they start having ectopics. So ectopics will sound like this. This is an ectopic. So basically your heartbeat should be like this. But when you get, that's an ectopic. So when you have this extra beats, then it's trouble. When you have a slow heart rate, you have to be a little careful that time. It's a good idea to meet a specialist because a slow heart rate can cause something called prolonged QT interval. Now I don't want to get into what prolonged QT interval is. It's on the ECG, but it can be very sinister. So this is, of course, in advanced cases. So we're a little careful about this. So because there are certain drugs like antidepressants, antifungal, certain uh, anti-anxiety drugs, uh, some antibiotics, which should not be given, whereas the QT interval is prolonged, especially it will only be prolonged if you're having a slow heart rate and bradycardia. Otherwise, some people have, go around with a normal rate, nothing's going to happen. But if that comes in, good idea to talk to a cardiologist, right? I'm promoting myself, actually. <laughs> <Being a cardiologist. laughs> so then you have another problem that they have high blood pressure. So a lot of times this is controversial and in dispute, but now they found a factor called EDRP. EDRP is called endothelial derived release factor. So this actually what it does is it dilates the peripheral vessels and is dependent interestingly on thyroxine. So if I don't have thyroxine, this EDRF will be low. So what will happen? My peripheral vessels will constrict. So the heart has to pump more so the blood pressure goes up. So that's why, and they find, what they found very interesting studies is that diastolic is more than the systolic. So it's one of the causes. So because the diastolic is more than the systolic, the pulse pressure, which was, you know, the difference of the systolic, the high pressure and the low pressure, which is diastolic is called pulse pressure. That is narrow, that is less. So it's very interesting. I uh, don't want to get too technical, but basically uh, cardiac, you know, these are the problems you have. You have this high blood pressure, you have bradycardia. Uh, then of course you, you can later on uh, you know, these misbeats and in further conditions, you can land up with uh, cardiac output problems. And if the cardiac output problems start arising because of cardiac failure, and already if the cardiac failure is there, it gets worse. Then there are problems of, you know, sodium uh, entire pathophysiology because there's some, some other hormones released and they have hyponatremia. So, you know, it's not a very simple thing. Uh, if it goes very well, if you, you diagnose it early, you do extremely well. So the, the, the point why I spend time with all these symptoms is keep, keep these symptoms in mind. Uh, that's why I narrated them twice. Try to go uh, to meet a physician or get your test done. Dr. Amrish Mittal um, 
brilliant endocrinologist, probably the best in the country, who's going to give you a very good idea exactly uh, how to move the ball forward with investigations and treatment. Uh, I think you're not going to get a better person and you're not ever going to get free advice like this again. So take, take every, every word he says, like, like the gospel, like the Gita, because thank he you, is. Thank you, Dr. Bhatia. I think uh, you said it so well. Maybe sometimes the symptoms are so subtle and mild that you can miss it. But uh, uh, like you said, uh, it affects everything. From head to toe, or I may, I may say from hair to toe, <laughs> everything that is uh, there. And uh, so the best thing is uh, it's critical to uh, sort of diagnose it and treat it well. So Dr. Bhatia, are there any more complications that we have heard so much? Look, like three main complications that people should uh, look for uh, if, if they have hypothyroidism and they are not being treated. Uh, what would they be like? So usually, you know, I would put uh, cardiac as still number one. Uh, also, because the LDL will be high in them. The That's the bad cholesterol. Uh, sooner or later, they land up with a low HDL because of lack of movement, because, you know, they start gaining a little weight and they're more important than the way they're more lethargic. Uh, so they, the good cholesterol falls. So the ratios go haywire. And then obviously it leads to, you know, angina, myocardial infarction and other, other things and can lead to various strokes. So uh, that is one. Another very worrying complication is the neuro, you know, which I said, the cognitive dysfunction. A lot of people are labeled as Alzheimer's and uh, dementia. And uh, mind you, this is one of the reversible causes of dementia, uh, which is not really dementia, but let's say reversible cause of, me of memory loss or uh, anything to do with cognitive function. Also, uh, you know, we, one should look very, very carefully because there's a huge association of iron deficiency anemia and B12 with these patients. And that a lot of people used to think that's because iron thyroxine is important for iron absorption, which is to a point, but not really, you know, so much. Uh, this happens more because of associations. They have gluten associated, you know, or they have gluten, you know, sensitivity or intolerance. They have celiac disease. Also, the, the iron stores are not very, uh, you know, they, they don't really, uh, they're not really there because gradually thyroxine is very, very important for the, you know, the integrity of the iron stores uh, wherever in the body, especially in the bone marrow. So you're low on ferritin. And like I said in the beginning, I would really check the ferritin also as part of the entire complex, you know. I would more than iron look at the ferritin because that's the, really the store you get to know. Uh, calcium is also a little tricky. Calcium is also a complication. It can be more of a complication. Uh, if you, you know, a lot of people are hypothyroid keep popping in calcium. Let me tell you what happens. If calcium does not get absorbed by the bone and hypothyroid, if you're hypothyroid and you're not in medication. So your calcium levels are very high, which can lead to a lot of side effects. So it's not a good idea to just keep, if you're hypothyroid, keep pumping in calcium. I would rather give D3 and vitamin K2 with it. Uh, because K2 channelizes the vitamin, uh, the calcium. So I would rather do that. Of course, Dr. Mittal will have better uh, ideas on this. Uh, so basically, these are the complications. You know. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhatia, for explaining the symptoms and complications so vividly. And uh, uh, so it ultimately, again, comes back to the same thing that it, it has to be detected early and treated in time. And once it is done, it's a simple disease. It's a deficiency disease. And the good thing is that all the symptoms, they get reversed. So thank you once again, Dr. Bhatia. And uh, now I'm very happy to now introduce our special guest for the evening, Padma Bhushan and BC Roy Wadi, uh, Dr. Amrish Mittal. Uh, Dr. Amrish Mittal is the Chairman and Head of Endocrinology and Diabetes Department at Max Healthcare, a group of 16 hospitals, and he's the domain expert on governing body of National Health Authority of India and also President of AIMS, Gorakhpur. Uh, recently, he was presented the Laureate Award for Endocrine Society of US for International Excellence. And that is not all. We have more to come. And Dr. Mittal has been the recipient of the Fogarty Fellowship from Harvard Medical School and uh, Japan International Cooperation Agency Fellowship. 
Boy Frame Award of the ASBMR and IOF Engine Health Professionals Award. Also the Springer Citation Prize for his paper on uh, global vitamin D status 2030. And also he has received the IOF President's Award in 2016. Wow. Welcome, Dr. Mithil, and it's yeah. our so honor to have you with us today. Uh, thank, thank you for you. joining us. Thank you, Dr. Gai and uh, Dr. Dheeraj, and uh, really enjoy being here. And it's always a pleasure to be amongst friends and particularly to be talking to people. One of my passions in life is uh, spreading awareness about disease because as Dr. Dheeraj so rightly pointed out, basically, we are also flooded with misinformation. And that kind of information that he gave you about symptoms and signs, you will not get clearly in, in most sort of texts or, or, or Google searches that you will read. Because they, the thing with those things is you, they don't sift out what is important, what is not important, what is relevant for you, what is not relevant. You know, it's like saying, yeah, Delhi roads are very unsafe, so don't drive in Delhi, that kind of thing, you know? So that's not correct, right? So you need a perspective, and I'm really happy that Dr. Bhatia has done that so neatly as expected and so nicely for all of you. And I'll be happy to answer whatever questions for, you, for the audience and for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mithun. So let me start with an interesting question. So we've seen like, a very high percentage of India's population suffers from hypothyroidism. So has the prevalence gone up in the last few years or what is it like? So I think that's a very uh, important question that many of us, many people feel that, oh, hypothyroidism has become so common, you know, it's, it's, it's all over the place. But actually, we don't know if that's true at all. Uh, and there are two points there. One is the fact that the spectrum of hypothyroidism, as you pointed out in your opening remarks, has changed because when we were residents and we were young faculty, then most of the hypothyroidism we saw was linked to iodine deficiency. And some of you may not be aware that it's one of India's most successful stories is to add iodine to common salt and that adding iodine to that eradicated hypothyroidism of that variety goiters and something we don't know often these days is cretinism there was endemic cretinism there were villages after villages of mentally retarded youth simply because they did not get iodine when they were growing up so that is hypothyroidism larger perspective uh, what has happened is that once we've got rid of that almost then the common variety of hypothyroidism like the rest of the world is autoimmune which means that autoimmune means that often the thyroid antibodies will be positive. Sometimes they're not positive, but still it's mostly autoimmune. And there are, they sort of attack the gland and the gland, the functioning goes down. And again, I'm really happy that you're emphasizing the point that when the function goes down, then if we replace that, it is actually like treating a deficiency. So when we are replacing thyroxine, it's not like a disease antibiotic or you know or or, or some even antihypertensive or anti-diabetic is replacing what the body can't make and that is the key point here so whether it's truly gone up we cannot say just better detection better test the tsh test used to be such a big deal it sounds funny now you know when the report used to come back and the accuracy and now it's available in every nook and corner and you get the result in a few hours sometimes less than a few hours so, you know, with all those tech, all that technology available, the awareness and the kind of subtle signs that Dr. Bhatia was talking about, that's very important. We used to see all the complications that he described yeah. once upon a time, uh, whatever he described, we used to see them. Now, if I see 10 people with hypothyroidism, not even 10, maybe 20, maybe one would be like that. And the rest are all very subtle, just a little depression, just a little puffiness, just a little skin change, just a little menstrual disturbance. You know, that's how the aura routine health check done, you know, in, in, in a hospital or an annual check. That's how most of them were picked up. So that's the big change. So I don't think that we have any data convincing to say that it's actually become more uh, sort of common. Yes, thank you so much. So better detection and I think heightened awareness 
and aggressive screening like that you said uh, actually uh, makes us believe that uh, there is a high prevalence right so dr mithil uh, who should get tested for hypothyroidism and uh, what are these tests uh, to diagnose it especially uh, like you said the symptoms sometimes are so mild and subclinical uh, so what are these tests to diagnose so, so uh, firstly who should get tested we have to have a very uh, sort of liberal policy it's almost almost like checking a blood glucose now uh, most people should have a thyroid test it's unless there are economic reasons not to do so at some stage of life you will certainly undergo a thyroid test kids who are not uh, you know when they are born when children are born if they are if their milestones seem to be delayed or they're not growing the way they would like that the obstetrician or the neonatologist would see even at birth or within the first few weeks after birth they should be tested they have typical signs we're not discussing that today but you know the doctor will tell you even there you know if the kid comes with a hoarse cry for example is not feeding properly even there you need to check thyroid at that level then if the kid child is not growing properly his child you know at, at the age of 5 6 7 the child is not growing properly he is falling behind in in his height is not performing well at school not so much in the height but not doing well at school he also needs to be tested and then as we approach adolescence then if there is a menstrual disturbance with the with the girl or again a height issue with the boy or childhood obesity uh, not severe obesity but definitely some weight gain some slowness some dullness both mental and physical not participating in sports all those need to be tested and and as we go along uh, women who have any trouble with their menstruation women who have had trouble conceiving actually if you ask me in pre pregnancy planning thyroid test is a must again economic reasons for it that is different otherwise every woman who is having a planned pregnancy should have a thyroid done absolutely a thyroid test done and it goes on in pregnancy that's the recommendation from our society and all societies is that everyone who's pregnant should be tested for thyroid so it goes on like that cholesterol problems you need to test for thyroid brain fog as dr bhatia described some cognitive decline you need, need a test for thyroid and weight gain per se so there is numerous reasons even depression uh, you know people with depression should get tested because sometimes thyroid can play a small but crucial role in the treatment and if the thyroid is not treated properly giving the fanciest antidepressants won't work so those are that suspect and what how do we test it's not that hard uh, it's a single blood sample most of the time 9 out of 10 doing just a tsh will will do the trick for you a tsh thyroid stimulating hormone if the value is above 5 then you fall in a zone i mean there are differences between labs but typically above 5 then you fall in a zone of suspicion if you are above 10 you almost always require treatment but a huge number of people fall between 5 and 10 which is what was referred to as sub clinical hypothyroidism where you may need more tests so i would say tsh and perhaps a t4 right at the beginning then if you fall in that in that band of 5 between 5 and 10 then a thyroid antibody test is almost always required because if there is evidence of autoimmunity then even with borderline thyroid function you may want to treat if there is no evidence of autoimmunity no clinical symptom and tsh is 8 you may still say in a 75 year old man ignore it we'll follow you up we'll see even 8 you may leave alone for a lady planning pregnancy a tsh of 5 with a positive antibody 4.5 you may want to initiate treatment so that judgment your doctor will take wonderful so like uh, dr mithil pointed out that uh, if it is subclinical tsh between 5 and 10 then we also need to do the tpo or the thyroid peroxidase antibody test just to confirm that uh, this does not lead to uh, hypothyroidism if not treated and uh, which is very simple to do and uh, just, uh, just many people come to our clinics and they they you know keep on repeating the tpo every time they yeah. they need to know yeah. about tsh so uh, we we just need to tell them that it has to be done only once uh, in their life and the titer going up and down does not uh, change the outcome of uh, hypothyroid disease or the treatment 
I think Thank that's so very much. important. I'll come in there because I think that's really, really important. I'm so glad you're saying that. You know, people try to treat the antibody tighter. You can't treat it. But then people go on saying, Kuch to tarika hoga. there must be some way. It doesn't matter. It's just a marker. We treat the TSH and T4. We don't treat the antibodies. There is no treatment. There is no sense in following that tighter and trying to titrate your treatment based on that. Sorry, but I thought that was a very important point you made. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mittal. And also, um, we have seen generally when we talk about the treatment and uh, uh, we talk to the uh, clients or the patients that you need to take the medicine. And so they generally avoid uh, starting the treatment thinking that it is lifelong and once they start, they will get stuck with it. So uh, is, the, is the treatment lifelong and what would it be like? <laughs> okay. so, so again, if you are in the subclinical zone, then very often it can be something that is an aberration, transient, and you know, the doctor may decide based on symptoms at that point to start and later stops, that's possible. Also, there are specific situations where you can get transient hypothyroidism, particularly in the neonate. Particularly in the neonate, you can get transient thyroid problems, which can get sorted out sometimes after particular kinds of treatment, you can get uh, transient hypothyroidism. Uh, the issue here, which is important to understand that if your doctor has taken a considered decision to start you on therapy, it means your body is not making thyroxine in required amounts. Now, whether the body will start doing that or not is in no one's control. The doctor has no control, nor can you do anything to uh, stimulate that production. We really have to follow the thyroid. We have to chase it. We can't preempt it. Remember that. You can't do something, I've done this, now I'm not going to get thyroid, or now it's not going to go up. You can never be confident. So therefore, I think it's important that we, that we uh, realize that many times autoimmune hypothyroidism is an irreversible condition. Frank florid autoimmune hypothyroidism does not reverse typically. Rare cases are there always, but and therefore you will require lifelong replacement therapy. That has no side effect. So that is important to understand. It is you're not going to require lifelong therapy because you started the medicine. The medicine is not addictive. You require, you may require lifelong therapy because the gland doesn't function. So the option is okay, you live with the high TSH and hypothyroidism or you pop this pill every morning. Right. So it's not that the, because some patients get very upset. I mean, one patient once told me he, you started medicine and this was a child who required a thyroid treatment like he was not growing and everything. But he said, you started my thyroid medicine, the father said, and uh, his thyroid medicine, and now you made him an addict for life. So you're responsible for the addiction. This is what I was told many years ago by a patient. So the drug is not addictive. It is just the T4 that your gland makes. The single goal of the uh, purpose of the existence of thyroid in our body is to make a hormone called T4. And we can give it from outside. That's all we are doing. Yes. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Mittal, so uh, the thing is that, yes, they, they start taking the medication, but sometimes uh, they have no idea uh, that... Uh, uh, how it has to be taken, whether there have to be certain gaps with food or supplements. Would you like to uh, talk about that, please? Yes, uh, I think that's, again, uh, I'm glad you're bringing this up because uh, that's something that we face every day. And sometimes one is surprised that someone has had thyroid for 10 years and still making a mistake in that. And then you wonder, I mean, how, uh, you know, sometimes our communication is not as good as it should be and we may give a handout or explain or the assistant explains something gets lost so whatever else we do we may not do we always explain hypothyroidism treatment to the patient which means pop your pill first thing in the morning when you get up take nothing after that for about 40 45 minutes you can have water but nothing else and then have your breakfast or whatever and if you're on supplements in particular calcium or iron then take them at lunch or dinner because the gap between the thyroid pill and these supplements has to be at least four or five hours. Another important supplement that interferes in all this is biotin. Biotin is used all the time, I'm sure in VLCC. Anyone who deals with cosmetics deals with biotin because it helps in hair fall, right? 
So if you're using biotin for any reason, and then if your pills has biotin in it, you know, then it can vitiate the result. It won't affect your thyroid. It won't affect your, your, your body physiology. But in the test tube, when the test is done, then it interferes. So if you're on any biotin preparation, which everyone these days I see is on, you have to stop it for about two days, maybe even one day, uh, but before you give your thyroid blood sample. So testing for thyroid has to be without biotin. That's very important because biotin gets into the blood and interferes with the measurement. Wonderful. So uh, Dr. Mittal, I'll just reiterate for the viewers, uh, which is, this is very important. So like uh, Dr. Mittal has just explained, it is a simple hormone deficiency disease, hypothyroidism, and treatment is also very simple, replacement of the thyroxine hormone as a convenient once a day pill has to be popped early in the morning first thing, and it has to be taken regularly, should not be stopped or change the dosage on your own. And uh, like it has to be taken empty stomach, not to have anything for next 40 to 45 minutes. No supplements like calcium or iron. And if I, if I may add soya products also for at least five to six hours or four to five hours, maybe. And uh, yeah, so once uh, the replacement is done and the hormone reaches healthy levels and you become absolutely a normal person in every aspect. And like uh, uh, Dr. Mittal said, the pill is not addictive and it's not habit forming. So you can just take it and it's such a simple thing to do. Right, doctor? Uh, yes. The crucial point in thyroid is the diagnosis and the suspicion to suspect at the right stage, as Dr. Dheeraj highlighted, so many symptoms. So any of those don't have necessarily have all of them. Do suspect, get tested. Once tested, if you get good advice from a good doctor, it is not difficult to manage. Contrary to all the hype that you hear, the difficulty is in the diagnosis, not in the management so much. Except in like neonates or pregnancy, those are really highly specialized situations. But otherwise, uh, it's not difficult to manage. Absolutely. So, uh, Dr. Mittal, some of our clients, uh, in fact, many of our clients, you know, uh, when they come to us, uh, they say they don't want to start the treatment because they think it is lifelong. And so they get started on some alternative treatments, which actually don't involve replacing the hormone. And, and they are also promised a cure. So are there any such effective alternative treatments for hypothyroidism? Well, the truth is that hypothyroidism is an autoimmune disease and all the alternative therapies are based on giving iodine or those kind of things in various forms. So, so uh, in my experience, as well as in the literature that I have read, and I've been treating thyroid patients uh, for 37 years, wow. uh, these therapies don't work. They are misleading. Uh, they can interfere with your thyroid medication also sometimes because that's very sensitive to absorption, you know? So kuch bhi lenge, which has more uh, sort of minerals, this, that extra, you know, that can interfere with thyroid absorption. So I would strongly in this case for sure, discourage alternative therapies to treat hypothyroidism, number one. Number two, the reversibility that you see sometimes is a natural reversibility that happens in a small fraction of people who have this borderline subclinical kind of thing and has nothing to do with what you're taking. So I would discourage people, but all of my patients try it at least once. I've seen that once in their lifetime, they get convinced and they stop the medicine and try and they come back with TSH of 100 and you know, all kinds of things. So I, I don't recommend that. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. I think it, it, it's going to be very helpful for many, many of our clients. Uh, so going on to the next question, uh, that uh, when diagnosed and treated appropriately, all the What happened? I think we lost her. Uh, if, can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Doesn't I'm matter. The question is chat box, no? Yeah. Yes, so uh, one question which I can see on chat box is asking: Is pregnancy uh, related? You know, would would you 
Yeah. Anything about pregnancy you would like to add about yes. you know, diagnosis? Or... I think that's a very important area for thyroid in pregnancy for all of us to understand. Uh, the important thing is that a thyroid test is uh, important as a part of pre-pregnancy planning. If you don't have thyroid and if you even have borderline values, you have to do a thyroid antibody. And in this case, talk to an endocrinologist for sure and get started and optimize your TSH to come below 2.5 uh, uh, if you're antibody positive uh, before uh, planning pregnancy. That's number one. Number two is that uh, if you already have thyroid, then when you're planning pregnancy, the control becomes more stringent. So often you have to increase the dose. Second. Now, the third point, which is very important, by and large, if you're well controlled, you will have an uneventful pregnancy. There will be dose adjustment required during pregnancy. That's correct. But you will not uh, uh, usually... I mean, there is a slightly greater, greater risk because if antibodies are high, there's slightly greater risk of fetal loss, but it's not enough to lose sleep over. So most of our hypothyroid women go through pregnancy uh, like a walk in the park without any problem. Uh, uh, and it, one should not be scared at all. Just plan it properly and you're through. So good. The take home message for everybody is that diagnose it properly. And number two is if you're already a diagnosed case, make sure that your T4 which Dr. Mithil has already said in the past that T4 is the key and your TSH are well controlled uh, and it'll be like a walk in the park. Like he says, there'll be no problem at all. Uh, I think um, a lot of questions are now all on diet. So we can now, uh, Dr. Amrish, shift to uh, Dr. Dipti, yes. but wonderful yes. having you with us. Really wonderful. Uh, Dr. Mithil, besides being a friend, is a very eloquent speaker and very clear about everything. And it's an honor actually to share the webinar with you. And uh, thank you for taking your time. Really, very, very. Uh, people are asking about homeopathy. Homeopathy, uh, Priya has already been taken up. Uh, we would advise against it. Uh, like he said very nicely, that sometimes, you know, patients get so frustrated taking medicine every day. They try out something new and then they again come back, uh, you know, with the TSH as high as 100. And, uh, you know, so it, 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 it doesn't really help anybody. It makes matters worse for the doctor and the patient. So don't do that. So, so before I sign out, Dheeraj, just make two comments. Please. I saw those questions pop up. One is exactly ah. about homeopathy. In, in homeopathy, what they use is either IDM, IDM or some crude thyroid extract, thyroidium. So what happens with those is that they also interfere with our medication. So then it becomes all hodgepodge. So I would prefer to avoid that. And the other question is about OJ pranayam, which I also practice. But if you your throat clear, it doesn't regenerate your thyroid. So on that note, uh, I think I'll... Right. Thank you so much. So uh, Dr. Dipti will now take over. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amrish. It was really nice having you and all the questions. Some of the questions, um, I think we'll, we'll take it for, further with the, uh, you know, you can send them uh, and they, they will be sent, uh, the answers will be sent to you. The, the team, you know, who is behind all this will, you know, from the corporate office, uh, they, they will, you know, they, they, they will let us know and we will definitely answer them because now we're running out of time. So Dr. Dipti is a well-known nutritionist, probably one of the best in VLCC. She's an educationist. She's won a number of prizes and uh, it's uh, nice to have her on board as always. And again, uh, I'm sure she's, some of the questions you've been asking about magnesium and diet and things she'll be uh, here to answer. So Dr. Dipti, um, what, what would you suggest for hypothyroid? What, what, would, what is the basic diet which you feel uh, is necessary? Yeah, so thank you so much, Dr. Bhatia. It's always good to share screen space with you, Dr. Gai, and today, especially with Dr. Amrish Mittal. So yeah, I've been following actually and reading all these questions that are popping up in the chat box. So, you know, just to begin with the kind of diet. So, uh, you know, like it is often seen and all the researchers have proven, you know, that uh, uh, overweight and obesity can lead to definitely hypothyroidism condition. And also because, you know, being overweight and obese uh, leads to a condition called leptin insensitivity. That is your brain does not recognize leptin. So as a result of that, it has been shown to actually uh, be one of the causes of the condition of hypothyroidism. So losing weight becomes very important. So we've several times discussed the weight loss diets with people. 
and uh, but weight loss has to be done in a healthy fashion not going in for a crash diet or anything like that and definitely not going in for uh, you know extremely low calorie diets um, and not eating appropriately so if uh, anyone needs any support for a healthy weight loss diet you can also connect uh, uh, to your nearest VLCC center where we make you lose weight uh, basis the condition of hypothyroidism and we have 310 of them uh, you know and uh, for weight loss also one thing that needs to be taken care of is to control the amount of carbohydrates carbohydrates have to have to be exclusively complex uh, so no nothing no food made with maida or refined flours and uh, a drastic reduction in the white sugar intake and all the processed foods like biscuits and cookies and breads and pasta has to be kind of really cut down <clears throat> and uh, the sleep cycle also has been shown to actually you know play a very important regulatory role when it comes to uh, controlling the condition of hypothyroidism so a good circadian rhythm that is early to bed early to rise is very very important a good uh, fluid intake is very important of about 3 to 4 liters per day and um, of course like uh, a good fiber rich diet and a good physical activity is very very important uh, to control this condition of hypothyroidism now over and above this there's so many people asking and you know these days whosoever i meet you know they feel very good about taking all these uh, sendha namak and uh, you know the pink himalayan salt all these kind of different salts you know because they think that that's more organic and they don't want to take in these uh, uh, you know iodized salt that comes in from the market because they seemingly are processed so this is one advice i'd like to give to all our viewers uh, is that please continue taking the iodized salt because iodine is imperative for the production of the uh, thyroid hormone so hence we have to continue because the other salts like sendha namak and the pink salt may not have uh, iodine so you can actually read the label uh, there are some pink salts in the market that actually come as iodized but iodine salt is mandatory to be had for this condition and even otherwise as dr amrish mittal has pointed out that you know this has been one of the uh, most successful mass campaign of our country india where we actually you know like uh, given iodine and uh, you know taken care of the deficiency that was uh, happening you know the iodine deficiency that happened in our country and there are two more things dr bhatia had actually like to add is uh, the intake of selenium and the intake of iron rich foods which are very important so let me just brief them about so when we talk about the selenium the selenium rich foods are generally legumes that is rajma chole kale chane lobia soya bean so these are the selenium rich foods and intake of these becomes very important and um, well how much our uh, nuts and uh, dry fruits are something that's important so how much of that is very important so it has to be one fist uh, of the nuts in one day nothing more than that and uh, the second one is of course iron so what happens in our country we are primarily vegetarians even if we are animal food eaters you know we do not consume it more than maybe twice in a week or two meals in a week i should say so because of that you know the iron levels generally are also low so that means the iron in the vegetarian sources of food is called the non non heme iron which is not something that our body can take in very easily so to be able to increase the absorption of the non heme iron it is very important to add vitamin c to the food so vitamin c would be green chilies it can be curd as being part of a plate um it can be the indian gooseberry amla these days in winter time it comes like real nice and fresh and is very very rich in vitamin c tomatoes of course coriander leaves or the usual dhaniya pudine wala chutney which is so popular all over the country can be had as part of our plate the food plate so that takes care of the vitamin c so now when we have vitamin c in our food plate the iron gets absorbed very easily and the levels of of course hemoglobin starts rising and uh, so these are little considerations that we need to take care of uh, you know when it comes to the food and diet thank you yeah. thank you so much dr deepthi i'm sorry i got dropped due to some technical hitch i'm back and uh, for the viewers i would like to uh, you know sort of introduce uh, dr deepthi verma uh, she's been uh, there for over 25 years in the field of nutrition and dietetics and currently heads nutrition at vlcc's 
uh, skill development. She's a, she's been a lecturer, a medical nutrition consultant, a writer, and an editor. And uh, also, she has been felicitated with several awards for her contribution to nutrition, uh, including a Lifetime Achievement Award in September 2000, 2019, even though she's so young. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Deepti. And uh, you very nicely pointed out uh, that obesity and hypothyroidism are uh, two common clinical conditions that have been linked closely. Uh, obesity in generally is actually general, sorry, generally uh, regarded by patients, you know, as being uh, obesity due to thyroid dysfunction. However, like you said, uh, the research indicates the reverse, the leptin hormone, uh, which is released from the fat cells in obese people may actually trigger an autoimmune response to thyroid and thus cause hypothyroidism. So uh, it's very important, uh, like you pointed out, that losing weight uh, if you're obese and uh, maintaining it will always help keep the thyroid uh, gland healthy and healthy diet and managing iron, calcium and selenium deficiency associated with hypothyroid is the key. Great. Uh, so, Dr. Deepthi, there are many, many myths regarding certain food articles uh, which may cause hypothyroidism. So, uh, what are these uh, goitrogenic foods, as they are called? Yeah. Yes, Dr. Gai. Firstly, it's very good to have you back again. So, <laughs> yes, you. goitrogenic foods is again something that, you know, everybody thinks that, uh, you know, so many people come and say, Ki, are you unko thyroid hai? Unho ne soya bean khana band kar diya. Ya unko cruciferous vegetables, jase, uh, broccoli and uh, cabbage and cauliflower nahi khana hai bilkul bhi you know peanuts bilkul bhi nahi khana hai lentils nahi khana hai so no guys it's not like that at all i mean like the uh, goitrogenic foods basically are the foods that uh, uh, you know does not let the synthesis or making of the thyroid hormone possible in the body so uh, it does not let the iodine uptake happen so, but then, you know, like for this condition, like goitrogenic foods, yes, I mean, like there are these chemicals called goitrogens, which are present in these foods, you know, like cruciferous vegetables, uh, peanuts, soya bean, lentils, etc. But um, anything that the nature has made, it is for us to be consumed. Okay, firstly, and secondly, that to be able to, you know, interfere with the synthesis of making the thyroid hormone, these goitrogenic foods have to be consumed in a huge quantity. So obviously, in a normal household, we don't take more than a katori of cabbage, aloo vegetable or cabbage peas, or even if it takes soya bean, it would be only once in a while. And mostly soya bean is eaten like, like in the form of soya chap in our country or the nuggets. Uh, or even if it is lentil dal, it will be at one meal or maybe four times in a week, you know, like four katoris in a, uh, you know, like in a week, I would say. So even peanuts is not kind of a staple, you know, it is only taken occasionally once in a while. So yes, to be able to, you know, make them interfere with the synthesis of the thyroid hormone, it takes a lot of these to be eaten up, which is not possible. So please, everybody can continue to have all these foods that you think are the villains for your body if you you know, kind of have the condition of hypothyroidism. And please be physically active. And Dr. Anjoga is the best person who can actually talk about uh, the physical activity. Thank you. So, Thank you so yeah. much, Dr. Deepti. And yes, uh, you have answered uh, many questions from our viewers. I can see in the chat box about the food that we need to take. And uh, somebody has asked, what is cruciferous um, uh, vegetables. So like uh, Deepthi pointed out, cabbage, broccoli, radish, uh, these come under, uh, you know, cruciferous uh, vegetables, which were sort of not allowed actually to be had in hypothyroid, which is not true. Like she has mentioned, you can have all of them, the favorite vegetables like cabbage, broccoli, radish, soya, soya foods, peanuts and all that she just mentioned. Just go ahead because uh, you're not eating in that much, uh, that much amount to cause any harmful effect. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deepti, for gu guiding us with healthy food choices, always valuable for our health, right? So yes, like you pointed out, exercise, which is my favorite. Uh, so no exercise 
won't make your uh, thyroid produce more thyroid hormone or reverse the condition. But uh, this does not mean that you need not exercise. You know, exercise and being active is very, very important for our general well-being and helps hypothyroid and obese patients to lose weight too. So uh, this, you, you can just follow the general exercise plan and it holds good for everyone, whether you are hypothyroid or anybody else. So those who want to lose weight, whatever be their motivation, I would just reiterate uh, the following, uh, you know, uh, the process or the following schedule for your exercise, which will help you uh, to be well and also to lose weight. So uh, moderate intensity aerobic exercise for an hour is ideal. Now this one hour, you'll say, oh, it's such a long time. So you can you know, split it up across two, three sessions. Uh, you, you can include brisk walking, jogging, swimming, skipping if you're not too very much overweight, uh, treadmill, cross trainer, uh, dancing and playing sports. Anything, anything that gets your heart beating faster. Yes, but stay well hydrated. And you know what, uh, along with this one hour of exercise, and this is the schedule I'm saying for someone who wants to lose weight. So you must add, um, you know, some exercises which, uh, which add muscle to the body because it helps you burn more calories. So add 15 minutes or so of resistance training, also known as strength training to build muscle mass. You may use exercise machines in the gym or free weights or dumbbells or resistance bands. Or if, you, if you're not a gym person or weight person, like I, I don't like to uh, do weights. So you can use your own body weight uh, to do uh, resistance exercises like crunches or lunges or squats or planks arms and leg strengthening exercises, or for that matter, yoga and tai chi, they are such good uh, muscle building, strengthening and toning exercises and also increases the flexibility. Uh, so all in all, uh, we're just saying that avoid being sedentary. Take breaks uh, from sitting, move and walk around as much as possible because being sedentary and sitting too much is linked to an increased risk of obesity, heart disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, and even some types of cancer. So never, never lose an opportunity to get up and walk whenever you can. And uh, you know what? You can invite your family and friends to join you to help you keep motivated. Use a variety of exercise to keep up your interest, make exercise a regular part of your healthy lifestyle and try to exercise at the same time. You know, it makes it uh, easier and it sort of becomes a habit. So um, uh, I have some questions uh, which uh, were uh, uh, your, uh, asked. Dr. Anju? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, so, so basically, one of the questions which pertaining to what you've just been saying, uh, Tejas is asking that can you increase the lean body? Uh, can you increase the uh, basic metabolic rate? So which slows down in hypothyroid? I think that's a good question. And I'll just take it quickly. Uh, the only way you can take your metabolism up is by the like, just reiterating what Dr. Anju said, is by increasing your lean body mass, which is your muscle mass. So good idea is to go to one of those uh, VLCC centers, have you them to do your body composition analysis, get your baseline lean body mass, LBM, work through the physiotherapist or the fitness person in the center, how to increase your lean body mass. And once your LBM increases, your metabolism will go up. Also high fiber diet will help, but nothing like increasing your metabolism by doing this. So this is one very important question which is coming up again and again. I thought I'll address it. Yeah, Dr. Anju, over to you. Yes, please. Thank you so much. And uh, there are uh, there's one more question. Uh, uh, is there calcium deficiency in hypothyroid, which you had explained, if you would like to reiterate, Dr. Bhatia? Yeah. So, so let, uh, let me one thing explain. Calcium is very tricky in hypothyroid thyroidism. A uh, lot of people, they line up with high calcium, in fact. 
a lot of people we used to think you know there's low calcium so give high calcium diet or give calcium supplements but if you give too much of calcium it doesn't get absorbed if there's lack of thyroxin in hypothyroid it does not get absorbed onto the bone so the blood calcium goes up and not in the bone so that's an issue for that to go into the bone it's a good idea to give vitamin d3 provided your d3 is low and give vitamin k2 now vitamin k2 natural form is very good so there are a couple of things like natto which the japanese eat which is like soya beans fermented and the national uh, the national dish of germany uh, is something called sauerkraut which is nothing but uh, cabbage and apple cider fermented basically yes. and they also call it cabbage pickles so these <clears throat> and, uh, you know k1 converts to k2 so it's a good idea to have a good k1 uh, some people don't have an enzyme to convert k1 to k2 so k2 let me explain to you is is basically it it channelizes the calcium to the right place which is the bone rather than into your heart and into the wrong places so vitamin k2 there a lot of studies coming up a lot of excitement about vitamin k2 it's a brilliant vitamin and i think it should help you all so that's the story about calcium so wonderful wonderful doctor one more question priyanka has asked that what if one has all the symptoms but the blood test shows normal tsh yes so look at your don't only go by tsh or tsh is a wonderful screening test and that's the first thing which is but also look at your ft3 and you look at your ft4 right and then there's no harm at that point if there's a strong suspicion look at your tpo if your ft3 ft4 tsh tpo thyroid peroxidase antibodies antibodies are all normal then you do not have hypothyroid your symptoms may be overlapping with something else like pcos can overlap fatigue for example can be because of low b12 low d3 low iron low ferritin so you could be thinking is hypothyroid but it could also be you know these other other issues so don't go by that and Thank somebody you. else has written that you know uh, i have had my thyroid removed at surgery and now i've gained 35 kilos i'm taking aldrotoxin what could be the cause now the cause is if your tsh is less than 2 then it is not hypothyroidism it is something else so you look for insulin resistance we had done a very nice uh, talk uh, last month with uh, dr uh, anup mishra uh, regarding this and had spoken on you know how to diagnose pre diabetic conditions or insulin resistance by doing hpa1c and fasting sugar and other things so look at that look at sleep apnea you you 35 kilos overweight you may be having osa obstructive sleep apnea very important cause of weight gain so please uh, meet a sleep specialist who deals with this you know who deals with sleep apnea because if your oxygen at night when you sleep snoring and is dropping your stress hormones will be released including insulin which convert carbs into fat and then it's a losing battle so look at your osa uh, look at you know look for osa uh, if you know and then uh, i would i would definitely look very very hard at uh, pre pre diabetes definitely wonderful wonderful doctor there is one more interesting question from uh, manisha mittal and she's saying hi how can water retention be treated in hypothyroidism yeah so water retention actually the swelling you have in hypothyroid is not really water retention that is because of there is there's a very interesting substance which they've just discovered recently called glycosaminoglycan so that is what causes that's why you don't get pitting edema so when you when you press on the legs you get non pitting edema and hypothyroid which is no enduration you get non pitting <laughs> that is because of the substance that gets deposited there you know into your tissues and the problem but if you get pitting edema then it means that you're having some other problem it could be sodium retention it could be high insulin which causes sodium retention but or it could be some medicine so then for that you come to diuretic diets for diuretic diets dr dipti verma is the best she will tell you but anyway i can tell you take a lot of come <laughs> on she can tell, tell you that's her line so you take diuretic yeah. diets Think natural. Don't go for Lasix. Don't go for Dietro. Mm -hmm. Do things naturally. It's always better. So Dr. Dipti will give you a list of uh, you know what we use for dietary diets. So, oh well, Dipti. a very interesting uh, vegetable that we get everywhere in every part of India is uh, Lopi Pinda Tori. They are very very good foods. You know to actually reduce the water retention. The citrus fruits, oranges, kino, malta, or whatever you all call it in different parts of the country. 
so you know the, all the citrus fruits are very good for water retention as well of course you urinate much more so there's nothing to be scared when you have all these loki tinda tori and all the citrus uh, fruits and that's actually draining the water out of your system and barley water is considerably good you know so that is again that you can have and uh, for a day or two try and have more of these vegetables and you'll see a drastic reduction in the water retention thank you thank you so much deepthi and i would like to add just one simple thing you know sometimes it is nothing but dehydration if you're not drinking enough water the body tries to hold the water and you you get a sort of water retention uh, which 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 when you drink enough water gets resolved so look for simple things first and then uh, think of the worst right so uh, i think we've covered almost everything it has been a wonderful session and again to reiterate hypothyroidism is a simple disease easy and affordable to manage and uh, there is no need to panic if you suspect it seek expert help early to get correctly diagnosed and uh, follow the treatment exactly as prescribed by the doctor and what Dr. Mittal said, "Take care of small things like uh, the gaps and avoid supplements near uh, the time when you have taken the drug. Do not stop or change the dosage of the drug on your own. And uh, another very important thing is, once you start the treatment, it takes four to six weeks to notice the change in symptom. So please be patient. It's not a magic pill." So some people also uh, may need small dose adjustments initially based on their periodic test. So leave that to your doctor, and you will be absolutely fine. So okay, then at VLCC, our uh, focus is on the combined benefit of managing diet, activity, and lifestyle to keep our clients healthy and well for for life. and you all know that uh, our teams of doctors physiotherapists nutritionists and therapists and wellness counselors they work together on custom designed regime for each client to help them achieve their wellness goals and it's just not about weight loss or centimeter loss you know it, it's all about being healthy and well so thank you all for attending our webinar and guiding our conversations with your wonderful questions uh thanks also to our panelists uh, dr ambrish mittal dr bhatia and dr deepthi for all our learnings today and uh, we really hope uh now you have better understanding of hypothyroidism how to manage it for yourself or uh, someone you may know and if you wish to know more there is a vlcc center near you and uh, uh, where our team of experts is just waiting to meet you so wish you all a healthy life filled with happiness and fulfillment and good evening to all and see you soon bye 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 thank you